Well, hello, Renolda Church. Hope you had a great Christmas. Pastor Chris here, Pastor Allen's out of the pulpit. He'll be back with us next weekend. Special word of welcome to all those who are joining us at Captured on the Village Campus, our Saturday night service joining us at the Village Campus on Sunday morning. Union Cross, Clemens are joining us online. I have a little confession to make. I don't know the words to any song. You know, when you go to seminary, there's only really two things you learn. You learn how to count a room, and you learned this little trick called the watermelon principle. I don't know if you know this or not, but any song can be filled in with the words watermelon. Well, my kids are beginning to catch on to this as we sing Christmas carols all the time at our house, and I'm just making up words to the song. I have no idea what any lyric is to any Christmas song. And finally, one of my kids said to me, Dad, are you just making up the words and I said just making them up as I go and so now the funny game is to turn off the radio when I'm singing to see what I'm actually singing about it reminded me of when my dad forced me to be in the children's choir in the third grade and we were all gathered up there for our big presentation for the year we were singing hark the herald angels sing which let's be honest is a little hard for a third grader because there's a line in there that goes god and sinners reconciled well chad who was sitting about three people down from me he knew none of the words and no one had taught him the watermelon principle yet so as we were getting ready to sing god and sinners reconciled chad louder than anyone else in the choir shouts god and sinners dressed in style are you ready for some good news? When Jesus arrived to break a season of silence, it was important that God leave no doubt that history had changed. God did this through a common prophet and an uncommon voice. Several weeks ago, I had the privilege to speak to a group of college kids who had all of these questions about why we believe the New Testament. And one of my favorite things to do is to show up in these college groups and make a presentation on why we can trust that the New Testament as we have it is trustworthy and what it says about Jesus is trustworthy. And then at the end, I always uh, have a time where I'll answer any questions that students might have. And it's interesting because I started my talk there the same way I start any of my preaching opportunities, which is to thank God that every word on every page of all the scripture is about Jesus. And so when it got uh, to question and answer time, about three questions in, one of the kids raised his hand and said, do you actually believe that the whole Bible is about Jesus? And I said, well, it's not about Jesus, but the whole Bible points towards Jesus or back at him. And I talked about how that the whole Bible in the Old Testament was a series of covenants, commitments that God had made to his people, Israel, for which he would fulfill in those times, but would point towards a time in which Jesus would be the fulfillment of the final new covenant. And I said, we have these portraits of the Gospels that tell us these unique ways in which Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament law, of all of the writings, and of all the prophetic teachings. And he said, you know, I've never heard it that way before. And I said, well, you know, what we have in these Gospels are these unique people who couldn't have colluded because they're telling the story in a different way. And so I said, you know, the reason we study the Old Testament isn't only because it reveals Jesus to the world, but because it reveals something of God's heart to the world. But as you read the Old Testament, you'll see that there's a crimson thread, a Jesus thread that weaves its way through there, but there aren't a whole lot of miracles in the Old Testament. I mean, there are certainly miracles in the story, the Red Sea and manna in the Moses story. Uh, there are, it says, a season of miracle that surrounds Elijah and Elisha. There's at least one miracle in the story of Daniel, the, uh, probably more, but at least the fiery furnace. Yet by the time you get to the last book of the Old Testament, written by Malachi, we see that he's writing during a period when the kingdom of Judah is getting ready to fall. The last king of Judah, Zedekiah, has come up against the great leader of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar II. And Zedekiah ignores his prophet Jeremiah and the kingdom is about to fall. And in that book, Malachi promises this, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. 
and the Lord in whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. That's a prophecy about John the Baptist, but that's 400 years in the future. And so Malachi, this last prophet of the Old Testament, promises that there will be no prophet in Israel for 400 years. There have been no promises of God for 400 years by the time we get to the New Testament. There have been no miraculously heavenly appearances for 500 years. And there's been no season of miracles like we saw during the time of Elijah and Elisha for nearly 800 years. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. So as we move into the gospel of Luke together today, it's becoming very clear very quickly that we are entering into a new season of church history. To rightly understand Luke's gospel, we have to understand two foundational principles. One is, what is a miracle? The definition of a miracle is simply this. There is no rational or naturalistic way to explain what has happened. There's no way to explain the new circumstances except that God has intervened. And keep that in mind as we begin to understand that we're in a period where no Israelite has lived during a time where they would have seen a miracle. It have been 400 years since there was a prophet or an intervention of God in a unique, miraculous way. See, we have these four accounts of Jesus' story in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Two of them are certainly eyewitnesses. Matthew, the tax collector, and John, the son of Zebedee. These are people whose accounts we have of Jesus calling them to follow him and them laying down their jobs and their futures to follow him and give their lives away for the ministry of Jesus. Now, some might argue that Mark himself was a follower, eyewitness of Jesus. Mark came to saving faith because of the preaching ministry of Peter. So it's possible that Mark had been following Peter around, thus following Jesus around. There are even some speculation about times in which Mark shows up in the gospel narratives, but no one questions whether or not Luke is an eyewitness. Luke is certainly not. Luke lived in a small town where Paul had come and started to preach about this Jesus person. He preached the gospel, and under Paul's preaching, Luke came to saving faith. Luke was a physician. He went off to med school and made his parents happy. And then he settled in the hometown where he opened a practice and spent all of his days prescribing penicillin for the sniffles, right? But as he heard the preaching and teaching of Paul, he knew that Paul was doing something different. He wasn't building temples. He wasn't keeping Old Testament laws. Paul was planting churches. And in these churches, people are proclaiming that Jesus is king. And Luke gives his life to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit inspires Luke to begin to write a historical narrative of Jesus of Nazareth. And in doing so, Luke writes so much that it flows out of the book of Luke into the book of Acts. And Luke wrote both of these books so that people might know about the work of Jesus. But there's something unique about Luke's gospel. In the New Testament, there are 35 unique miracles. There are 35 unique miracles in the four gospels. And Luke is inspired by the Holy Spirit to include 20 of them. Now, there are times where a miracle shows up in multiple places. But Luke has more miracles than any of the other Gospels. And the reason is clear. Luke is not an eyewitness. And so if Luke is going to establish the validity of his story, he has to leave no doubt through the record of signs and wonders that God was doing a new work in his story, that God was doing a new work in the ministry of Paul through Luke. And so Luke begins to record all of these different ways. See, there have been no promises or miracles of God for 400 years, no miraculous appearances for 500 years, and no season of miracles for 800 years. And then all of a sudden, shepherds begin to see angels, and Israelites begin to have visions, and people are healed. And during Jesus' work, there are so many miracles that people can attest to, that the Gospel of John says that if we were to record all of the miracles of Jesus, it would fill all of the books of the world. And Luke knows that these 20 miracles that he's going to record 
are going to validate what he is saying. Much like us, Luke was living in a period where people would be suspicious of the supernatural. After all, they were living hundreds of years from the last time anything like this had happened. And in doing so, in giving an overwhelming testimony of the miraculous work of Jesus, he's leaving no doubt that this is what's happening. And we pick up in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. The time in history is clearly identified here in verse 5. During the days of Herod, we know from world history that Herod reigned over the location of the Jews from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. And during this time, we think that Herod probably dies around 2 B.C. So sometime between 3 and 4 B.C., Jesus is born. And we're near the end here of Herod's reign after 400 years of silence after the last prophet. Now, Herod is not a Caesar and he's not a king. He's what we might consider a mayor or a governor. He'd been appointed to have authority over this group of the Jews. In fact, many people called him the king of the Jews a title that would later be used to mock Jesus while on the cross. See, Herod had authority over this entire area, and he was from the family of Esau. If you go back in your Old Testament, and if you get through Genesis 11, you'll begin in Genesis 12 with what we call the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, these great rulers of the faith. Well, what we find is that Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and literally, while they're still in the womb, they're fighting. And they continue to fight to this very moment. But during the time of Herod, we see it explicitly because Herod is an Edomite. He is from the line of Esau. And he wants to kill the one who is from the line of Jacob. And so even in this first century world, Esau and Jacob continue to fight. 400 years since the last prophet, 500 years since the last heavenly visitor, 800 years since the last miraculous season. And then miracles begin to happen at an unprecedented pace in an effort to confirm that the God-man has arrived. One of the things I find interesting about the Christmas stories is their simplicity. Just a few chapters record the most important moment in human history when the Son of God is born. No fanfare. Not only is Jesus not accompanied by fanfare, but the people who record his arrival are absent the fanfare. I was thinking about the ways in which we celebrate royal births. Like when William or Harry announce that they're going to have a kid, immediately people start putting up flags and printing faces on t-shirts and printing up special mugs that you can buy. People begin to gather around hospitals and gossip about the gender and the name of the royal baby to be born. When Jesus comes into the world, you know what's suspiciously absent? Baby Jesus coffee mugs. You know, honestly... On Christmas Day, if we're able to gather our entire family, there are 12 grandkids, five kids with spouses and parents, and I get lost in the mix. To understand just how insignificant Zachariah must have felt, you have to realize that he's from the tribe of Aaron. And there are 18,000 priests. There are 18,000 people who have the exact same job you have. Jesus' arrival isn't marked with any of the fanfare that you would think a royal birth warranted. And none of the people who are telling the story of the arrival of Jesus are accompanied by fanfare either. Zachariah is a normal guy, one of 18,000 people who had the exact same job. I frequently worry that my middle child, who's my daughter, is getting lost in the mix of trying to shepherd these two boys who run into each other all day. 
I never want her to feel like as the middle child she was left out. Imagine that if you were one of 18,000 middle children and your story really had no significance other than a lot of other people had the same job you did. And it continues in verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. It's interesting here that the scriptures make note of their blamelessness. I mean, usually we don't get character descriptions of people in the Bible. Because in the end, the Bible is really telling the story of a whole bunch of people who stink and Jesus who rescues them. It's basically the theme of the Bible is that we're all really, really the same. So we all really, really need a Savior like Jesus. But here it talks about their character. And I think one of the things it's doing here is it's leaving no doubt that the next verse, which is going to tell us something about them, which is that they're very old and they don't have a child. And not having a child in the first century world is a big deal. It's kind of posh now in our modern culture to wait really late to have kids or to never have kids. And that's fine if that's the decision you make for your family. But in the first century, it was a terrible thing to not have kids. Who would take care of your wife if Zachariah died? Who would take care of Elizabeth? Who would inherit the possessions that he had collected as a priest over all of these years? And so it was a big deal that he didn't have a child. And I think our nature is sometimes... When things aren't going the way we want them to go, is to blame ourselves. And I wonder if there had been a time in which Zachariah had self-inspected and decided that he needed to cut some kind of deal with God to get himself a baby. After all, surely they'd been praying about this for 60 years and God had not answered their prayer, it appeared. And so he began to ratchet up all the ways in which he might get God to be faithful and bless them. And so the writer here, Luke, leaves no doubt that this had nothing to do with the sin of Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were blameless before the Lord. You know, that's one of the things that happens in the Christian worldview is that you find the balance between the pure gospel and legalism. Legalism would say you need to cut a deal with God for God to bless you. And so whatever that might look like, I, I've got to do better, I've got to do more, I've got to say the right thing. You've got to cut a deal with God so that God will be good towards you. But the period of the gospel says there's nothing you could have done to make God ever bless you. So instead, God gave you the blessing that was due his son. And so I think what the gospel writer here is setting us up for verse 7, which says, but they had no child because they, Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. You know what it doesn't say? is that they were praying for a baby. I think by the time they get to this point in their story, they have completely given up hope that they're ever going to have a baby. And so it continues in verse 8. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, 18,000 priests, all from the tribe and the line of Aaron, they would divide those 18,000 priests into 24 divisions. In one division would be responsible for the temple work two weeks of the year. In general, they stayed in their own small towns and worked in their own small towns as priests. But two weeks of the year, these 18,000 priests would be divided into 24 divisions, and one division every week would come to Jerusalem. And so here, Zechariah and all the other priests from the Aaronic line would be called up two weeks a year to offer sacrifices in something called the Court of the Israelites. Verse 9, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. It would be impossible for me to overstate the importance of his lot being cast. The temple was divided into several sections. The first section was the outside portico. Anybody could go to the portico. Lots of business transactions would happen there. But there's just inside of that, you had what's called the court of the Israelites and the women. And there you could have the Gentiles and the women. I'm sorry, the Gentiles and the women. So you would have that next section there. And then you would have an inner court. In this inner court, so you have portico, Gentiles and women, and then the inner court for the Israelites. But what it really meant was Israelite men. And every day in there, morning and evening, 
you would have to offer a sacrifice. First century priests were essentially butchers. They would take animals into the court of the Israelites, portico, the area for Gentiles and women, and then the court of the Israelites. They would go in there and they would begin to offer these sacrifices. And they would offer it in the morning and they'd offer it in the evening. But there was one job that was reserved for someone who they would either draw from a deck of cards or roll a dice or they'd figure out some way to choose them and they would just trust the Lord. And that was the person who would burn incense. And you only got to do this one time in your whole life. And there was no guarantee with 18,000 of them that you would ever get to do it. But on this day, Zachariah's number is pulled. And he gets to go not into the portico, not into the place for the Gentiles and the women, not into the, the court of the Israelites, but into the holy place. No one got to go into the holy place. It actually was there to separate the people from the next location, the deepest part of the temple was called the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was meant only for one person, the high priest. And only on one day, the high priest would go into that Holy of Holies. He would take a spotless lamb and he would lay it down on the Ark of the Covenant and he would sacrifice its blood and its blood would pour down on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And it was serious business going in there. It was so serious that if you went in there and you died, they would tie bells to your ankles so that when the jingle jangle of the bell stopped, they'd known you died, they would take the rope they'd tied around your ankle and they would pull you out because only one person, the high priest, was worthy of going in there. But this was Zachariah's day. Zachariah's number had been picked. He had heard probably from people about the beauty and the glory of being in the holy place. And so he enters into there and he sees that his job is to carry this large gold bowl that would be full of embers. And he would go in there and he would lay it on the altar of incense. And like the Psalms of Ascension that we read, the aroma of their praise would go to the sky. Here's the problem, though. Zechariah goes in there. And he notices that the altar of incense is sitting right next to the door into the Holy of Holies. And the only thing that kept you from seeing into the Holy of Holies was this enormous veil that stretched feet into the air. And Zechariah's got to get up there close to it. And he knows that if he looks into the Holy of Holies from the holy place, if he slips and falls and stumbles into it, immediate death. I had to be honest. That's definitely the way I'm going out in the Old Testament. I'm definitely the priest who peaks. I mean, after all, I was the kid who spent his Christmases opening all of his presents with a paring knife and then rewrapping them, hoping his parents wouldn't know that he already knew what he was getting for Christmas. Now my wife won't even put the presents out till the morning of Christmas because she knows I'm going to cheat. And look, I'm definitely the guy who would have peaked into the Holy of Holies. As a matter of fact, one of my first questions when I get to heaven is, I want to know how many dudes went down in the Holy of Holies. Like, how many of you guys peaked? How many of you guys are now in heaven because you peaked into the Holy of Holies? Because it's definitely the way I'd have gone out. In the first century. And it says in verse 10, and the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. See, this temple moved east to west from portico to court of Gentiles and women to the court of the Israelites to the holy place to the holy of holies. And so, Zechariah was righteous enough to get to that point, but he's standing there next to that, offering this incense offering. And all of a sudden, he's already afraid. Then an angel shows up. An angel shows up. Verse 11, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. There are no stories of angels appearing in the holy place. He's standing outside the veil that kept man from God. And because man was so unclean, so unrighteous, that if they even peeked into the veil, they would die. And angels aren't these 
cute, cuddly, fat babies from Charmin commercials, right? These are warriors. They stood taller than humanity. They carried swords and wielded angel armies. And here Zachariah is already petrified that this is one chance and an angel shows up. And verse 12 says, And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Honestly, these people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when they're encountering angels, they get a lot of grief for being afraid. It feels like the only righteous response of a sane person. I mean, after all, Gideon in Judges 6, when a heavenly visitor confronted him, was afraid. Moniah, the father of Samson in Judges 13, says, we're going to die. Isaiah saw God lifted high and heard angels singing and immediately condemned himself. The same happened to Ezekiel, Daniel. Mary was greatly troubled. Shepherds in Luke 2 were told to not be afraid. Disciples in Matthew 17 were told not to be afraid. John the Revelator fell on his face like a dead man. Verse 13 continues, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. Why are they always saying that to people? Like, you don't get to tell me what to do when you're the scary thing. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you should call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. One of the keys, I think, to understanding the story of Zechariah is to acknowledge that God answers prayer and his timing is perfect. I think there is a tendency to assume that when we don't clearly see God at work, he must have either not heard our prayer or not answered it. When if there's anything that's abundantly clear in Scripture, it's that God answers every prayer. And I think he answers every prayer the moment he hears it. The problem is, is that we don't always like the answer we get. God answers prayers, I think, in three ways. Yes, no, and not now. I'm sure that Zechariah and Elizabeth were convinced that the answer to their prayer was no. The whole time for 60 years, they've been lifting up this petition to God and what they thought was a no was in fact a not now. Not now. This is not the moment that I'm going to interrupt 400 years of history. Not now, God was saying to them, this isn't the moment when I'm going to send my prophet. Not now, God was saying, this isn't the opportunity when Jesus is of the right age to fulfill all 360 prophecies that he had to fulfill to prove that he was the Messiah. Not now was God's response. And on that day in the temple with the angel, God finally said, yes. Now's the moment when I can send to you the child that will leap in the belly of the mother who will bring forth the word that the world is no longer silent. Prepare the way this yes to Zachariah, pro Zachariah proclaimed. The one who takes away the sins of the world has arrived. God says it's been a not now and it's now a yes. And what Zechariah realized in that moment was that the not now was always in his best interest. It was always in the best interest of the world. And when you begin to trust God's character, when you begin to understand that God's intentions towards you are good and pure and holy, the yes is because God believes that it's the best thing for you. And the no is because God is holding out to give you something better. And the not now is because God is aligning all of his world for your best intentions. God has heard and answered your prayer, he says to Zechariah. But the next scene is very interesting. I've been perplexed about it for a long time. In the natural, it might be that 
you would celebrate this good news. After all, they've been praying for it for 60 years. But honestly, if we were being really transparent about the ways in which we might feel, we might not celebrate. After all, Zechariah and Elizabeth are 80 years old. I mean, he's coming to the end of his life. It's likely that he hadn't asked for this baby to come in many years. And in verse 18, we see his response. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. I do like that he doesn't call his wife old. That's a good play by it, right? And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. Now listen, there's only two of these jokers named in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. So if you got one of the named angels, it's a big stinking deal. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Verse 21. And the people who were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple probably assumed that he'd been a peaker and he was dead. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. Now the reason they probably saw this is because he's had an encounter with an angel with probably the glory of the Lord's around him. And he kept making signs to them and remaining mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went home. This reminds me of another story that shows up in Acts chapter 12. So Peter's in prison, and all these people in the first century church are like gathered together in these home churches, praying, Lord, please let Peter out of jail. Please let Peter out of jail. Please let Peter out of jail. God lets Peter out of jail. He comes home, knocks on the door. He says, Peter's home. And they said, can't be him. He's in prison. <laughs> so he's been praying for a son for all of these years. And God gives him the answer, and he doesn't believe it. See, I don't think that the reason he's been made mute is solely because he's being punished for his lack of faith. After all, there are lots of times in scriptures where God comes to people like, hold on a second, I'm going to need you to double test that for me because I'm not sure I believe you. Abraham in Genesis 15, Gideon in Judges 6, Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. All, word of the Lord comes to them and they say, 20 second time out, I need you to prove that to me. And none of them leave the encounter unable to speak. So it seems strange that Zechariah would be punished for this type of unbelief. Maybe that is what's happening. That the unbelief is so unbelievable that God removes his voice. Or maybe when he emerges from the temple mute, the people knew he had seen a vision because they knew the glory of God had come upon him and it had left him speechless. I think the lack of belief was a part of it. But it's also the fact that Zachariah's muteness, his unbelief produced such few words that this is another sign and wonder that God is using to leave no doubt. I mean, after all, he was a priest. He was a professional talker. And God removes his voice. Another sign and wonder of Luke's record that shows that even the priest had such a holy encounter that he could no longer speak. Ironically, leaving no doubt that the season of silence had come to an end. The power of the story of Zechariah is this. It was the very thing that Zechariah was afraid of that saved him. The story of Jesus, the sentence about your salvation begins on Christmas Day, but it ends on Good Friday. There's this remarkable thing that happens on Good Friday. See, Jesus came and he was born of a virgin, fulfilling even these obscure prophecies, like the prophecy that shows up about him being born of a virgin in Isaiah or him being born in Bethlehem, a town that no one had heard of, 
and Micah. But then Jesus lives the life that we could never live, fulfilling all of the prophecies, all of the prophecies, the over 300 times that the Bible said, you will know the Savior has come when he fulfills this and this and this. And if even one of those prophecies had been missed by Jesus, then Jesus couldn't have been the Savior because the whole Old Testament was pointing to the time when the Savior would come. So Jesus lives the life that we could never live. And then this remarkable thing happens. The Savior of the world, the King of the universe, the one who was there at the very beginning of the story and was there when creation was spoken into existence. And Colossians says that it's actually Jesus that's holding together the creation. That person who could call down angel armies, who could defeat all of the enemies, could have done anything he wanted to do because he was the rightful heir to the title deed of the earth, allows himself to be dragged up a hill like an enemy. And in doing though, they take Jesus up to a cross. And they hang him there and they mock him with the title that Herod had given to himself as the king of the Jews. And as Jesus is taking his last breath and proclaiming rhetorically that it is finished, meaning that it's really just beginning. This remarkable thing in human history happens. It's recorded in every world history book you ever pick up. There's a massive earthquake in Jerusalem. A massive, epic earthquake. So great that it shifts the very foundation that the temple was built on. And in that moment, as the temple foundation shifts the veil that hung between the holy place and the holy of holies is torn in half and so that no one would ever say it was done by human hands or human efforts it's torn from the top to the bottom and in doing so the space between the holy place and the holy of holies is exposed Surely Zechariah was at the cross. Jesus was his son's best friend. They were cousins. They'd grown up together. All the stories they must have told as Jesus waited to come and be the Savior of the world for those first 30 years. Zechariah the priest gives life to the prophet John the Baptist and John the Baptist becomes Jesus' best friend and as they drag his body up the hill surely the family of Zechariah was there maybe Zechariah had passed on and maybe just John the Baptist family was there to watch what was about to happen and in that moment as that veil was torn you could look from the location of the cross from east to west and for the first time in Israelites history you could see in to the holy of holies the very thing that Zechariah had been afraid to look into was in fact the very thing that saved him because as Jesus hangs on the cross he is literally laying himself on the mercy seat and as his blood is shed on that cross it is poured on the mercy seat Zechariah was so afraid to look to the other side of that veil and it was because of God's work through Zechariah that everybody can look to the other side of that veil the very thing that Zechariah feared the most was in fact the thing that saved him. You do not have to fear God. You may not feel like he's answering your prayers right now, but he's never that far away. And if he's telling you no to something you have longed for, it's because he has a better plan. And if he's saying not yet, it's because he's aligning his universe for your benefit and his glory. As we enter into a new year full of uncertainty, joy, fear, hope, for being honest, things that we just aren't that certain about, we can be assured of this. Jesus is on the mercy seat. So God is 
is totally for you. And that's the gospel.